We had many newcomers in this relatively short program, yet it didn't take long for this work to take off, as it is known for, with that power and intensity. Do you have also some of these observations you could share with us? Well, yes, certainly there was a kind of feeling of quickening and having that many complete newcomers is known for giving room for some eventualities. There is always a possibility where one needs to give that extra attention making sure that people are not, so to speak, left on the side of the road, not sidelined, because those who are already familiar, experienced in this work, they go deep. And as we hit the first level of unstressing, then things begin to surface, right? When things begin to surface, it's always uh, has that element of un unexpected. So these retreats, of course, are known for being very different from an average cut of your retreat where you come and you know you're going to sit in a silent room. Right? You're going to sit and everyone will just meditate and everyone will come out of meditation. And, uh, it's a quite a different atmosphere and different ambience. So that first, usually, couple of days are always, always tentative and I would even say tender because there is a, a possibility for newcomers, some people always to feel um, overwhelmed, to put it plainly. And because of that uh, sense of over, being overwhelmed, uh, it does not allow them to really, really uh, drop deep enough to, for the process to take over. And you are right to point out that this time around it was very uh, interesting that despite the number of complete newcomers, uh, we seem to have gone in one unison very, very quickly. In one unison of... of of that coherent wave as it was rising. Whatever that wave was bringing out, and obviously that the first wave of waves brings out the accumulated level of stress. So there are uh, jerkier movements, right? Uh, more disturbing sounds. There is more of, a, of that accompanying phenomenon of involuntarily releases, uh, somatic releases, and of course, accompanied by a lot of vocalization. This is a signature of this work. We have uh, did our due to relate to it on, on many occasions that one of the specifics of, the, uh, of these particular meditations that they are accom the accompanying phenomena has this ambience of sound which is made of various different sounds and we often speak about it as the kind of like a, a certain symphony, a certain kind of orchestrated uh, level of sound, ambience of sound, like an, uh, being submerged into a field of sound, which is made of, you know, someone's just humming, just humming, someone's openly vocalizing, someone's hitting high notes, Someone screaming, so it has this also elements of a rock opera, <laughs> right? So, and what struck me, and in a in a very nice way, I should say, is quite early on. I think on the third sitting of the second day in the morning, we already had we already had uh, a certain level of. I would, what I normally call, what I usually refer to as that um, degree of, certain degree of um, 
coherence in the sound, even if there are still uh, accents or splashes of, of, of what stands out, right, due to this releases in us, especially as we begin to hit the deeper seated uh, level of what is known as level of the tr traumas that are begin to now get accessed. So, yeah, I think th this was a, definitely a very pleasant surprise uh, to have such level of coherence at such an early, early uh, stage in the unfoldment of the immersion. Yes, and it was also very interesting that there were many young people, whereas this, known, this work is known for uh, a lot of seasoned seekers and females, by the way, female uh, tends to take the lead. And yet I felt a very presence, a very um, strong presence of, of men. Did you also, was this remarkable to you as well? Well, I, I don't know if it was remarkable for me. I haven't even thought about it that way. Because, yes, as you pointed out, the, uh, the ratio of female energy and female presence is always higher and this, this has been the case throughout the years and I think it's maybe even the case in the demography of spiritual practices. I don't know whether this is specific, unique to all meditative retreats or what we call immersions if this is more unique to uh, this kind of work, which has that distingu distinguished uh, element of somatic quality to it, right? That it's not just a sitting, understanding something, or having guided meditation, where um, the guide speaks throughout. There's an area where one is encouraged to fall deep into that field, the field which becomes enlivened and begins to bring about a variety of extraordinary phenomena. Not that the phenomenon itself is a goal, but it's obviously a byproduct of something much more, much more, uh, I would say, subtle and often yields to understanding and often not really, really opened to the ration, rational kind of rationalizing. This is why some people have harder time to understand you know, why that is. So with, with regard to that demography and of having more younger people at this particular immersion, then this to me is a very, very telling sign. And I see this also as a sign that uh, there is a greater openness to this kind of work. Whereas in the earlier years, and for a number of years, I was at some point kind of remarked, like, gosh, it's like, you know, when will the young people start coming into this work? Yeah, we get all the old timers, we get all the people, you know, who have been at it all their lives, you know, we get all this kind of like, <laughs> Uh, from the stock of old, seasoned spiritual warriors, you know. I want to have fresh blood, you know, like I want to see the young, you know, hungry for this knowledge people. And it began to change. So this particular program, this particular time that we just had, was definitely kind of a, re a response. I don't know if it was a response from the universe or simply because there are more willingness, more openness, maybe even uh, maybe there is a also because it's no longer sort of seen in, in, in you know the, a lot of these young people. Uh, what really uh, strike me in a very very nice way that when the question and answer sessions came about, 
the quality of the questions that came from younger generation of people. The quality, you know, so that, that means that these people already um, certainly dipped into this work. Not necessarily the work that we do, that what this work is known, but certainly, certainly they are already began this process of deeper inquiry. So that was definitely, you know, encouraging sign. Encouraging sign for what this work has to offer, as well as the encouraging sign that there is this response. You know, because if these people are coming into this work, and of course, um, we want to see now these people will um, stick with this work, and whether they will come back, it remains to be seen. But based on, let's say, this last uh, couple of years, that definitely that this is on the rise. There's a younger generation of people, even people in their 20s and younger, right, are on the path of this neurophysiological transformation of consciousness, what Tantra is known for. So it's not just those who have tried it all and finally ready to come to the, you know, more intense and more kind of uh, Well, more willing to go into the work which is no longer just about reading, hearing about it, but has this visceral aspect of tasting it directly, first hand. So maybe yeah, just, just that, perhaps, for the moment. Yes, it reminds me um, of something you commented recently, how in times of uh, ease, in easy times, when everything flows like a song, spiritual practice is a luxury. But in times of crisis, as the ones we are going through collectively, there is a necessity. So. Yeah, did you, did you have any insights on this as well? Well, insights are plenty. <laughs> um, <laughs> insights are, you know, there's no shortage of the insights. But did you see this reflected in this emotion? I'm not sure if I want to immediately draw some conclusions with regard to people's understanding right now that the state of affairs in the world rests on their level of consciousness. Although this always, always has been spoken with encouragement to at least consider this possibility. But I don't want to jump at the conclusion that people already coming into such um, level of work because they have this understanding. I would prefer to kind of have a more grounded perspective. A lot of people still come into this particular work because of deep inner necessity, like deep, and very, very uh, motivated by the uniquely colored, let's say, conditions and conditionings. So you know very well that this work has always attracted uh, a quite a large percentage of people who have had some brush with awakening, who had gone through uh, some energetic transformation to whatever degree, and it did not all go well, or how it maybe one would have liked it to be. And therefore, this has this 
uh, it plays a, a big part, I would say. A big part where people come here with intention and hopes to bring not just greater clarity, but to kind of seek rehabilitation, reconciliation, realignment, plainly speaking, to heal from deeper seated traumas. So, therefore, speaking about uh, transformative work during the times of peace and, let's say, when everything is in, in more or less harmonious uh, environment is a luxury of a few. But during the time of crisis, and let's not forget, it's not that we are now, now suddenly experiencing crisis, the culmination, culmination of the crisis we've been living in. So it's in a way that any escalation that we see now is a, is an, a, a certain build-up. Whether we speak about this as a result of that build-up of a stress on the collective level, which simply erupts, erupts in, in, in ways that we can begin to count now, you know, erupts in any form of uh, unknown illnesses, diseases, discomforts, right, pandemics, famines, wars, um, the way the nature, environment begins to behave and everything. Of course, this can be dismissed that nature has always behaved in an unpredictable way. And there are plenty of voices and perspectives that all this is just like an attempt of New Age to uh, come into the importance, you know, coming into the driving seat that somehow uh, it's all down to human endeavor. But there is something, something here, you know, that more of a unified perspective that if we are the most evolved creatures on this planet in this particular moment in time, and there is a great indication that we are indeed these creatures that where the possibility of complete and utter self-reflection where consciousness can experience itself for what it is, not just driven by uh, instinctual impulses, then that places us in a very unique position. And that placing us in a very unique position, of course, is resonant with a lot of understanding in perennial traditions of the importance of the state of consciousness in a human being. Because the state of consciousness in a human being, as that old Indian proverb goes, like, if there is a peace in an individual, then there is a peace in the family. If there's a peace in the family, there's a peace in a tribe. If there's a peace in a the tribe, there's a peace in a nation. And so it goes. If there's a peace in the nation, there's a peace in the family of nations. But disquietude begins at a very, very, very seemingly insignificant localized level of an individual and begins to reverberate out, begins to reverberate and even the word out, maybe it's not really a bit reductionistic here, because it's reverberated at any of the fields of this existence. So that reverberation, if it sends out disharmonious vibrations, if it reverberates with uh, anything that comes from a place of undigested, unmetabolized experiences, which we simply refer today in spiritual jargon and language as traumas, then it all begins to kind of engulf larger and larger groups of people. And that engulfs whole societies. It then brings out the, this whole field is then becomes get get rippled, violated. 
So just to kind of like to bring it back into this, let's say, the, the, where the question itself came from, into the uh, kind of work that we do here. Maybe I'll speak about it in reference and relation to the work of art, the experience that a true work of art affords. In all civilizations, all, it doesn't matter how they uh, are known to us in terms of their development, the, the, there is a great revaluation these days in terms of what is considered to be evolved civilization. For a long time we have had that linear understanding because we were measuring it with an eye, or rather we were seeing it from an eye, where the very signs, let's say, of ethnography archaeology and anthropology and all this uh, began to develop into disciplines of their own, the perspectives that we began to project on these ancient civilizations immediately took comparative level of analysis who reached the higher degree of development, often having the dismissive view on what entered as term primitive civilizations. This is undergoing re-evaluation right now, as I speak, because it is within these primitive civilizations where the interconnectedness, the symbiotic relationship between macrocosmos and microcosmos hasn't been fractured. So if there was no attempt to, let's say, build structures, cities, uh, so, like highly complex societal structures, artifacts, it doesn't mean that people lived on the primitive level. We know that not to be true and all those who went into great depth in studying, trying to get access because it's nearly impossible, because the so-called primitive tribes of people who live in complete uh, harmony with nature, as nature. They reverberate and vibrate, almost they breathe with that, let's say, uh, desert or with that jungle. You know, they, they, they live in the environment as environment. The very little attempts were made to create independent existence in that environment, as took place in the majority of the, what we call, uh, evolved world. So that uh, perspective, let's say, in terms of um, the role and place of certain performances, and we now I'm speaking about the place and purpose of art, was always a cathartic, cathartic experience. Whether it's uh, any form of initiation, as the passage of time, whether this is a highly uh, evolved uh, performances like what was given birth in India and in Greece, ancient Greece, I should say, ancient India, right? The development of drama, of all the arts which afforded these various different forms that began to branch and develop on their own, like, you know, singing on their own, dance on their own. Uh, the art of painting, the art of, you know, so like we could see this, how it kind of had this oecumenical uh, uh, birthing place somewhere. But the purpose was always in the possibility of reaching a certain degree of cathartic experience, which is considered to be an act of initiation, an act of purification, and an act of transformation. The idea that art was for entertainment came much later. The idea that art is for the entertainment purposes, as kind of like just to relax and enjoy, is much, much further development 
Not that I deny this somehow or that it doesn't have value, but I am speaking now in relation to this work. We know very well, it's not a secret, that uh, there, is, there are great works of art and there are mediocre works of art. There are works of art that moves us in ways that we cannot explain. And there are works of art that are just like lollipops. They only have sweetness as long as it lasts, and then you want to spit it out. But what has an undeniable uh, shared ground in all real true works of art is that even if beneath a certain let me put it this way, uh, perfectly presenting itself form, which may even feel easy on the eye, or on the ear, on the experience. As we begin experiencing it, it has the capacity to take us through that experience into real depth, where that catharsis becomes a possibility. So therefore, all these theatrical performances, uh, the classical form of ragas, variety of ragas, the music, they were never considered to be an isolated event for, let's say, having fun at this evening or playing it here for the entertainment of the crowd. But it had a, a kind of a uh, lofty understanding that this is what reconciles, reconciles these laws of nature as we depart from nature and build a civilization. So the work of art is necessary here because it acts as a bridge to reconnect, reconnect. And the, I'm particularly fascinated with this whole um, theory of emotions and all the of which I speak now these days more and where I believe also the conversation will unfold in the coming years. The importance of it because this is where the possibility of being able to restore equilibrium and harmony precisely rooted in greater connectedness to what each and every emotion represents, and then the full register of these emotions, how a dissonance rising, arises when we are unable to integrate certain emotional experiences. Of course, we can say mental experiences, but really, even mental experiences leave their imprint not because of mental nature of these experiences, but precisely because the Whatever is the nature of any intellectual or mental experience, it somehow finds resonance at an emotional body. So it impacts us on an emotional level. And this is where perhaps the key to how the stress is laid into the system and why not every one of us are able to neutralize, absorb these experiences back into the fabric of our awareness and we end up carrying these experiences, carrying these traumas in our system, which in turn, of course, impedes our capacity for experience. So there is this catch-22, you see there's this unprocessed experience unprocessed emotional experience, emotional response, which is natural because we are much more refined in the way of our nervous system, much more refined. Um, of course, uh, this also goes without saying that a cat, a dog, can be stressed. And I believe, likewise, uh, that even a reptilian can get stressed. We know that monkeys certainly get stressed, like animals in the animal kingdom get stressed when they, they are pushed beyond the level of, let's say, the instinctual responses. Whatever happens there in that dance of 
uh, as part of that creative script in that wild hand, you know, when the gazelle is being slaughtered by a lioness on, on, on the hand, you know, is part and parcel of that coexistence, that ecosystem of coexistence. But there are conditions which lead to stress. And imagine if the, in the animal world, certainly what we subject pets and livestock is a completely whole topic of conversation. We as human beings in Cumba, a lot of experiences which we are unable to process. And this inability to process these experiences results in inability to experience fully. So let us put aside self-realization, enlightenment. The quality of this particular work already has its undeniable value in very quickly accessing that field. Accessing that field where these unprocessed experiences laid deep as a sediment in the nervous system. This is why, uh, forgive me for this uh, now comparison, it's not a mediocre work of art. So when people come here, they come here to experience the impact of a true work of art because of the cathartic nature of what this work is about. So therefore, of course, uh, that what takes us back to what we talked earlier, the certain degree of that readiness, if not trepidation, to see how people will be able to take whatever rises in the field, how the newcomers will respond. Will we lose one or two people? You know, who will need to be given extra attention because it's not easy. But we also know, and this is why I'm going through great length to give this analogy, some of the works of art meant to be a jolting experience. They meant to test the capacity of our sensory perception to almost, I would even say, push us beyond the limit of that. It's not a background elevator music or somewhere lounge music where you know, it simply caresses the surface level of affairs, you know. So, people were known to dance themselves into deep trance. That wasn't about just like a few movements, right? A little twerking here, twerking there. It wasn't, it's not about just um, hitting the right note. So, I would say that um, that quality, that quality of extraordinary level of, well, the willingness to go, to go, the willingness to go to the degree where one would be given oneself to this process. I mean, let's face it, if a person walks off the street into an opera of Richard Wagner or someone of that kind, Stockhausen, Schnitke, I mean Shostakovich, they will walk out in the first part of the performance. They will not be able to take it. Because our senses are already uh, polluted with the so-called fast food, with the so-called elevator-like quality of experiences. And even if there are more rhythmical, more kind of thumpy, you know, uh, drummy based, drum and bass based, these are all still belong to the era of entertainment. So, imagine uh, being suddenly in the presence of some ceremonial dance in North Africa. And all these different levels of throat singing. 
in Mongolia. If one's ear is not tuned to that, if one's ear kind of uh, accustomed to only this particular taste, this particular flavors of experience, they will find themselves in intolerable position of considering all this to be a noise, cacophony. I mean, I'll give you an example. When I started to get into Japanese music, traditional Japanese music, that is, I remember a friend or acquaintance, whatever, came by to my studio and I had happened to have the shakuhachi flute, this simple, very, very, very minimalist sound of the flute. But the notes that shakuhachi flute hits is very different from the Indian bansuri, although they're very, very similar. It's just that, a bamboo flute, a hollow wind instrument. After about 10 minutes, he started to display these um, symptoms of discomfort and eventually quite demandingly, quite almost uh, explicitly asked me to turn off this music, you know, because he felt disturbed by it. Whereas I was already finding great, great, not just resonance, great enjoyment in those seemingly, seemingly very different dynamics of the way the sound is produced and how the melody is not at all follows, let's say, the melody that we know um, in more of a Western European scale of music. Of course, I was, well, not that that person is not coming from the same part of the world or not having similar experiences, but, you know, I was already living in London by then and I was, I was growing up, I grew up in Uzbekistan, so I was already exposed to uh, very different kind of uh, aesthetics. Why am I speaking about all this is precisely because what happens in our programs and why some people find it's difficult and at certain maybe point intolerable is precisely that aspect. Is it because it has the cathartic quality and the first impulse is to reject that. The first impulse, I don't want to go there because it brings the discomfort. One may throw a counter-argument, counter isn't it? Why should there be any discomfort? Isn't meditation about sitting, relaxing and enjoying it? Yes, of course, but before we can sit, relax and enjoy, before the depth of meditation can be experienced, if meditation is really taking place, the stresses need to be brought to the surface level so as to afford the possibility of having that experience. Otherwise, it will be a very surface level of affair. And I've been um, giving analogies to many, many spiritual work done in very well-established within the very well-established spiritual movements, where this phenomena is very well known. The phenomena of uh, advanced programs is very different from what uh, an average meditator who learns, let's say, TM, just 20 minutes here, then, or learns this or that, you know, attends Vipassana retreat. And... But we don't have that luxury to have, uh, let's say, retreats just for the newcomers. So it's a mixed crowd and it has value of its own because it allows the possibility for the newcomers to be uplifted, taken by the field which is generated by the sum total of all the heartbeats of those who are already not only deeply familiar with this work, but who has done, who has done already some work on themselves, who already 
already or whose field is opened up enough. Because also goes without saying is that when we indeed had our advanced programs, when we have our advanced programs, it's a very different ambionic sound. The ambience of the sound has a very different quality. The harmony prevails almost from the very first sitting. And this harmony is extraordinary because it's layered. It's very, very complex. It's refined. But it also has that richness of intensity. In the settings as we had just now, there were a lot of disrupting sounds, disrupting movements. But that's part and, part and parcel of this work. So this, I felt this is a fitting opportunity for me to bring that analogy of what the true work of art really means. What is it for? And that Greek term, that catharsis, is really what this is all about. It affords the possibility for going beyond what the mundane life is. So that performance when people went in ancient India or in ancient Greece, at the early days of the formation of all these arts, before the arts split in variety of different independent forms, it was pretty much all performed in the open air. And all the totality of all this was there for the sake of that collective transformation. So the whole village, town, society, community can partake in a narrative which is conveyed through means that are uniquely, uniquely pertinent to what the performance invokes in every spectator. And through undergoing that experience available to a spectator, invoked by those who are behind the spectacle as actors, musicians. They together bring about that catharsis. So the audience undergoes that cathartic experience. So are the performance. And at least that's how I see it. It's great, great joy to be able to speak this out loud. Thank you for the opportunity.